Good morning, everyone. My name is Doreen Osafchuk. I'm from the New England Clinic UIO. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Calm in the Storm, Curtailing Antipsychotic Use in Long-Term Care, hosted by the New England Quality Care Collaborative. Before we get started, I'm going to quickly review a few housekeeping items. Excuse me, we're getting some background noise. Please mute your phone. This call will be this call will be recorded for training purposes. The presentation is available on the web page and the link has been posted in chat. Phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. Please don't place this on hold. If you find that the presentation is a little cut off, use your plus or minus icons at the top right of the presentation window to adjust your screen accordingly. Excuse me, can you please put us on mute? Our speaker, Dr. Fazzelli, will monitor chat throughout the presentation and answer questions in real time. You can answer questions in chat, but remember to send it to all participants. At this time, I will read all lines. The leader has muted your line. To unmute your line, press pound six. All lines are muted. I will now pass this over to Marty McLaughlin with the New England Coin QIO to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jabbar Fazelli. Marty? Thank you so much, Doreen. I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us on the call today. You know, uh, we're all very concerned about reducing antipsychotic drugs, and I'm happy to report that today's speaker is somebody who's found some really wonderful and innovative approaches to helping to reduce antipsychotic drugs. Not only is he a great champion of nursing home care, but he's also a passionate elder care specialist and a good friend to the New England QIO. We, um, we're grateful to have with us today Dr. Dr. Jabbar Fazelli, and he's passionate about many elderly causes, works as part of the Dementia Partnership, has, um, is the medical director for many of the main nursing homes, and so we're just delighted to have with us Dr. Jabbar Fazeli. Thanks, Dr. Fazeli. Thanks, Martin. And welcome, everyone. Um, at the start, I'm just going to say that I included about 100 slides here, not because I'm going to be having um, all the slides discussed, but I want you to have a comprehensive handout uh, if, if you um, reference it. Uh, later. So I'll take some questions during the presentations, but I will leave time at the very end uh, to answer questions as well. Uh, sometimes, as you can imagine, some questions could be answered with subsequent slides, so uh, I will leave enough time at the end once people heard the whole presentation that they still have uh, questions. Uh, this basic presentation is is focused on my work uh, after the 2012 uh, CMS initiative to reduce antipsychotic use, and we basically created uh, an approach, a program, a protocol that would try to achieve that objective and maybe achieve it. So we initially had uh, three facilities uh, that we um, covered. Now, if you look at the first slide, that shows you the national trend uh, for the first uh, three years uh, from the CMS initiative, and then uh, the subsequent slide is uh, the more up-to-date is now. As you can see, the uh, general use of antipsychotics in nationally has dropped, uh, but we're still hovering between 15 and 18 percent or so. Um, now, the following slide, as you can see here, these facilities, um, uh, and that's the national average for facilities today that are falling behind, and they're, they're late implementers, uh, which is, uh, you know, the best way to find worst performers, in other words. Um, and you can see that over the past five years, this 
at least some facility or in the tail end of the space that are still struggling. Um, our facilities here, uh, you can see the, uh, on the right hand side of the slide, uh, uh, this is Maine and the uh, National Average behind it, and this is before we started our program, and we have three facilities on the left side, Red and Pine Greenwood and Barney Crossing in Maine. Uh, and uh, we even later see that we had a fourth facility added, but this is what we started with, and um, and this is uh, two years after the initiative. So you can see the best performer, uh, Gergen Pines in this case, uh, where all the elements of our programs were implemented. We had a rate below 5% uh, that I'm happy to say we consistently sustained since 2013 and 14 up to now with uh, uh, 1 or 2% variation depending on our admission. Uh, this is uh, the same slide here for Dragon Pines, so you can see in the background the national and main average, and you can see the black line as the trend of antipsychotic use. And if you remember, when the uh, CMS initiative started, the goal was 15% reduction, so relative reduction, not going to 15%, and this was uh, way past the expectations uh, there. Our other facility uh, here, this second best performer um, uh, basically had a reduction, but we never really broke the 5% margin. We broke the 10% and we have worked around that. And, and we had uh, left that facility uh, in 2015, and I kept track in the antipsychotic data because it's public knowledge, obviously, and it's on Medicare Compare. And this is how it, it trended up. So uh, the good news here is that once the program was implemented, there was some sustainability. We're going to the doctor was gone, but there was some, uh, you know, obviously better benefit when the, all the elements were in place. The third facility was really, uh, I can best describe it as when you're implementing the program and the uh, other elements are uh, uh, supporting you, but uh, doing a kicking and screening, really. So uh, not a full implementation of the program, and you can see that, like any other quality initiative, we have an initial response, and then we're back to where we were, and ironically, it's not one of the facilities that is supposed to uh, facilities for uh, improvement, so it's one of the late like, implements. Now, there was a fourth facility. Uh, you can see here there's a steep drop in uh, 2015 uh, use for this facility, and that was uh, one of our DOMs, uh, the director of nurses from our best performance facility, moved to that facility, and then later the medical director, which is me, followed. And you can see that drop, um, that even the director of nursing alone was able to achieve uh, uh, use to lo roughly around 10%. Uh, but to go down to 5% and below, uh, you would really need the medical director involvement here. Um, I'm showing this uh, blurry slide just to show you that the uh, top performers in the state is one of our two facilities. Uh, so the best performer, Jordan Pines, you see it at the bottom uh, of the state list for usage of antipsychotics. So uh, the key lessons that we learned in the uh, COM protocol is that we, uh, under the best of circumstances, once it's fully implemented, we can achieve 5% or less, or less uh, usage in general. That leaves us with um, two or three or four focus patients. We call them focus cases. We will still have to um, treat them as challenging and needing constant uh, revision and monitoring. Uh, and those are the cases that uh, basically need specialized and patient-centered attention. Now, when we the reason I mention that is imagine when we're asking people to do a lot and, and change uh, everything around that residence, uh, oftentimes we're um, facing the issue of the practical uh, barriers to having patient sense care. But when you're looking at this from the standpoint of we're only doing this for three or four cases, it really becomes less impossible to do. Uh, by the same token, we hear from facilities who are small, let's say 25 beds or 50 beds, 
complaining that the rates are high, but they can't impact it as much because a few cases result in a very high rate of usage. Um, uh, and we usually use this data to basically show them that if you did one case uh, in a very small facility, it may drop your percentage use, say, by 20% if you have to sell the electricity or less. Uh, and that's a big drop um, from alone. So uh, being a small facility doesn't mean um, you have to deal with higher rates and not use it to your advantage. So uh, the, the uh, zero tolerance policy I'm going to mention here because the current protocol doesn't call for zero uh, prescribing. And uh, I mentioned because that's the approach for some uh, providers and facilities uh, to the CMS initiative, and I'm sure if you look at the numbers, uh, you will see that approach doesn't achieve 5% or less. They probably, you know, from the data I have used uh, for some corporate facilities that have their own physicians employed, uh, which uh, uh, makes it conducive to having a zero tolerance policy, uh, those facilities don't necessarily uh, fall on the best performance uh, list. Uh, sustainability uh, is a big challenge for everybody, I'm sure. And uh, in our case, we looked at it uh, in terms of uh, dealing with new admissions uh, was a big sustainability issue. It doesn't matter if you're reducing antipsychotics to be constantly adding new cases, obviously. And then uh, dealing with staff who are not on the same page and actually don't believe in the principle of producing antipsychotics. Uh, one of the issues we dealt with here is site referrals. Uh, we found that when there are more site referrals, there are more antipsychotic use, which I'm sure it's not a surprise to many of us. Um, and then one of the last challenges we addressed during COM was to address the issue of uh, shifting uh, from antipsychotics to other psychotropics. So it wasn't good enough to reduce antipsychotics, but we ended up with higher benzodiazepine use. Um, looking at your quality measures is important. I'm going to skip these slides because uh, we're going fast, but it's important to know that the CMS data is three to six months old, and so you need your uh, data to be reviewed um, monthly and you have a way of, uh, of dealing with uh, sudden spikes and addressing the uh, causes for that. So what is COM? Uh, the COM protocol has uh, basically uh, three modules plus one. So the three, mo the, the three modules are environmental, nursing, and medical provider modules. The plus one is the leadership triangle and the necessity that we found for the leadership to be involved at a very high level and to have a collaborative work between the medical director, the administrator, and the director of nursing. And that's important to implement all the three modules uh, that we have, and without it, it wouldn't work. Um, so uh, it's not a zero tolerance uh, program. Uh, we also don't mandate that everybody just did reduce. Um, uh, it's a very case centered, and only if it's appropriate for that particular case. It does not call for automatically signing off on pharmacy recommendations for gradual dose reduction. And uh, it, we do not avoid antipsychotic use for FDA-approved indications that are not included in the CMS um, initiative, for example, bipolar disorder, depression with psychosis, um, schizoaffective disorder, et cetera. But more importantly, if we have cases of delirium with two psychosis, if we have dementia, uh, with true psychosis, we do treat when clinically appropriate, and we are still exceeding less than 5%. So major culture changes that um, well, we address with um, the biggest item was really when we are discussing cases that are difficult, and at the beginning of the conversation, the stuff starts with, well, we've done everything already, can you help us? And that's usually a non-starter conversation. That, that's a prelude to a request for a silver bullet, uh, which is oftentimes uh, a medication. So we, we've addressed with our staff that everything being done is almost 
it's impossible to achieve. Uh, that there's always opportunity for looking for something to be done. And what can be done today could be done by tomorrow. Uh, the other thing is caregiver expectations. If the family and the staff expect the uh, dementia patients to all be using collaborative and cooperative with us and, um, and listen to us, then that may be an impossible goal to achieve. And, and that keeps us chasing ourselves. So uh, we do address uh, acceptable dementia behaviors are not treated. And then uh, a big piece is addressing new staff education because you could do all this and three months later you would have 20% turnover in your staff and you, and you would have to address that. Um, the, some of the technical barriers, uh, medical provider inconsistency in education and leadership support, over reliance on psychiatric services, um, the uh, other thing that is, I can highlight here is real-time um, uh, data collection and real-time feedback. Now, in best of circumstances and facilities, you usually see uh, a review of data at the quality improvement meeting, uh, and then at uh, best of circumstances, you would have a review of cases in the morning rounds or the huddle. Um, but what we've recognized is that most of the feedback um, needs to go to the night shift and the on-call, and usually they're not present during the morning huddle or, the, or those um, uh, quality improvement meetings. So we established a, a director of nurses with you with a medical director within one to two business days of all cases uh, that uh, either an antipsychotic was started or there was a call after hours um, to the providers. Uh, and so uh, the director of nursing would have an opportunity to directly discuss this with the uh, night shift uh, that was involved with the case. This is extremely important because we, if we're doing education and feedback and it's not going to the right people, then we're spinning out. All right, this, uh, I'm going to include a few pictures of Maine. Uh, this is in Kittery. So the four modules, first the environmental module, I'm going to just mention the systemic environmental changes that we address. Now you can see the lighting reduction, I'm going to include a picture here. So you see the picture here, we have, we reduce our lighting to every other light at night because um, uh, the facility at night was looking like a factory floor. And that's not conducive to somebody trying to calm down and, and kind of wind down at night. Um, we, the administrator was involved in discussing with the state the uh, light limitations by survey and, and making sure that we're within the boundaries of uh, regulation. The meal time change I'm going to mention here specifically um, because uh, we addressed the meal time behaviors or at least in focus cases that we have have a lot of challenges during meal time, not only for themselves but also for other residents. So you can imagine if your dementia is not as bad as everybody else, and you're hearing screaming and howling during mealtime, the quality of life during mealtime drops, and you may not enjoy your meal as much, so despite the fact that the facility has done everything they can to make the meal itself enjoyable. Uh, and uh, also, uh, this addresses other uh, care issues, like... Uh, residents who are incontinent often or low risk but they're still incontinent. When we separated the meal time for the focus patients from the rest of the population, it ended up helping those residents as well because the CNAs had more time to spend with them. So you can imagine splitting the time by half an hour uh, making a big difference here. Uh, of note, uh, Actually, I want you to think about which group we put first. So do we put the high-need residents first, the ones who need help with feeding, who have behaviors, or did we put the self-feeding, uh, low-maintenance dementia patients first? And the answer is that we put the self-feeding first because they eat faster, they don't need as much care. And then when the CNAs are dealing with them, um, more challenging uh, residents, they have more time to spend and they don't feel rushed. And once we implemented it in, uh, at 
the best performance of therapy. Actually, the staff, once they got used to that protocol, uh, they found it to be very useful and conducive to easier work. Uh, I'm not going to mention the rest, but as you can imagine, noise reduction and protocols around that were also very important, and most of you are going to do that. Uh, then there's case-specific environmental changes. Like I said, it's very, usually it's not very well received when you say change the environment for every resident the way they need it. Uh, and it's not practical when you first hear it. But it, you can imagine it's actually very practical if you're only talking about three patients or five patients. And when you do everything right, you end up dealing with only two or three or four or five patients. Uh, you don't have to think of it as insurmountable. Um, and sometimes, uh, the, all you need is really like a wheelchair change. If somebody's in a jerry chair and they're restless, uh, obviously if you put any of us in a jerry chair, we would be restless eventually because not very comfortable. Uh, but uh, that's like an easy way to look at how to problem solve around the environmental change. So addressing anything that could be bothering the resident uh, in their own environment. And if you have uh, an opportunity to place the residents. We, we also address the uh, flexibility to work around the resident where they're seated, for example, for meals or for activities. So for resident to resident issues happen often. We found an easy solution is placing a seat, an empty seat, between that resident and the rest. And that creates, you know, a barrier for them to have those negative interactions as kind of a, a vicious cycle. Uh, we are part of the environment also you can address diet. I'm also I'm just gonna say that if you use sugar at night, which is often what we have for comfort food, um, uh, ice cream, etc. You can imagine that that, that provides a sugar rush for somebody whom you're trying to um, encourage to sleep better. So if you have a high protein snack or something else that has protein in it that produces a serotonin surge. And we all have the experience of eating a meal and then feeling sleepy afterwards. So we could use our diet to our uh, benefit. Um, we spend a lot of time on environmental just because that's something that's not addressed in, in conversations often. Uh, but I'm going to uh, now discuss the nursing staff uh, module. The, uh, at the outset, I would say that we survey staff uh, when we do the in services before and after uh, the education session so we have a better idea of um, the effectiveness, effectiveness of the education as well as focusing their attention on uh, key points. Uh, one CNA key point is that uh, uh, I always, when I review cases, I find that there's always uh, or often a case where you have a CNA that has great response from the residents and uh, better luck, so to speak, to deal with them. And um, uh, we once you interrogate that CNA and, and ask probing questions, you'll find that there are secrets to the trade, and, and they are doing things different than the rest of us that work. Uh, but the key point here is that that uh, information is not systematically uh, passed on to the nurses or the CNAs necessarily. So creating a habit of passing on that information and asking for it. So always asking, does anybody work better with this resident? What's your secret? The other thing that's uh, pertinent to CNAs is the routine care. So we often ask the question, is, this, is the routine care necessary? Is it uh, required with the same frequency and is the timing right? Uh, also, crowding of the residents, just because it's convenient for us to have two or three people doing the shower, it doesn't mean uh, the resident will take it uh, positively. So, uh, dementia residents who are resistant to care can be also very sensitive to being overcrowded uh, with uh, people around them. Um, so, addressing evening showers, I found that, you know, if you have a focus case, let's say, if you're looking at, if you take any of your cases uh, who are on antipsychotics and ask these questions, um, are they getting their showers at night? That's an easy fix. We could move that shower to the morning where they're least resistive and we have the most staff to help us or 
not to be as rushed as evening time. Uh, I find that uh, CNA actually decides the shower time and decided based on uh, their time allocation and their uh, resident pension loads. And uh, so the way to fix that issue is that we have our, our unit manager uh, deal with the focus cases, shower times, and make sure that the CNAs uh, have those particular patient showers in the morning whenever possible. So the uh, glucose scans for diabetics, the daily DP checks, and vital time checks for um, skilled patients. Now, uh, keep in mind that skilled patients require daily uh, vital signs and sometimes Q-ship vital signs uh, as per the qualifiers for rehab and skilled care, so you need to have a doctor's order uh, if you are going to reduce it uh, to below standard of care. Um, waking up too early, I find that most of our residents are woken up too early at 6 in the morning and sometimes if they haven't slept until 4, that creates a problem with that kind of routine without uh, advocating uh, what time is the normal time to wake up and what time does it sleep the night before. Um, uh, there are other items here you can see. The, um, so, one of the, uh, moving on to the nursing, the RN, one of the main things we have to address at first is, uh, is the types of behavior and the proper nomenclature. Uh, we can't address the problem if the description of the problem is wrong from the beginning. So if somebody is described as anxious because they're exit seeking, uh, that in a clinical sense means they have anxiety disorder, they have panic disorder, and they have, and they would have to be on benzodiazepine. And that's not true. So if there's uh, confusion-related behavior, it needs to be uh, described as such. Delusion, in mean, some families consider delusions as uh, you know, when when a, a dementia resident thinks the daughter is a granddaughter or a son is the husband, and that's not delusional. That's confused, confused state, but it's not delusional. Uh, there are also more obvious cases where if a resident says, my daughter plays, put me in the nursing home to take my money, they only say that when they see the daughter with the subject provider. It still is not too delusional. It's not persistent. It's more of a confabulation and fill in the gaps or trying to make sense of what happened uh, with a dementia mind. So um, then the other step is teaching. So we, we first describe what, what the symptoms are and how to describe them. Then we discuss what's uh, treatable and what's not. So dementia behaviors that are caused by confusion, uh, they're not true. Then if we go to the level of delusion, hallucination, we still have uh, cases where they don't need to be treated. For example, if somebody's having a hallucination about puppies, it's not necessarily requiring an antipsychotic to get rid of it because it's not bothering anymore. Uh, but if, if it's involving little people with knives in the room uh, and there's constant fear, then it's a big issue, and we have to treat it. And then the staff acceptance of the untreatable behaviors. I'm going to accept that there's no medicine to treat exit seeking to tell the resident or make the resident feel that they're at home. The only way they're going to feel at home is if over time they start seeing the place at home. And in some cases, they never uh, reach that point. And now, uh, one other thing to keep in mind is not only not useful to treat the confused case, uh, the confusion-related symptoms, but because confusion is the reason for the symptoms, when you make the confusion worse with medication, the symptoms potentially get worse. Um, we also address what serious or severe behavior. Um, I'm going to just say one thing here. Just, I had an incident where a patient hit me, and that was something I would never forget, and I remember the nurse running to go get the adamant because they had an adamant PRN at the time, and that was almost 15 years ago. And, uh, I, you know, I, that was a clear example of a mm. case where I could see how I was the trigger, where I moved too fast, I was checking somebody's um, uh, leg for a problem, and I was rushing. I had 
other patients to see that day, and I rushed, I didn't stop, I didn't pause long enough, I didn't make eye contact, and here I was in that person's face, and they hit me. Now, just because under other circumstances that would be considered a severe uncontrolled behavior, it doesn't mean that every circumstance is as such. So look at cases where there's residents who staff involvement where we consider it over the line and something that has to be treated as an opportunity to see what triggers that behavior. And maybe it's very situational and it doesn't need to be treated. I'm going to mention small talk real quick. Uh, if somebody is agitated, um, then you don't uh, are irritable. Uh, those are the residents that are not amiable to small talk. And it's really very hard to tell the CNAs and nurses to not initiate conversation with a, a resident. Uh, but it really what they need uh, when they're very irritable. Uh, some residents need to be treated like the boss because they were the boss. Again, what works today may not work tomorrow, but these are the things. Um, we also teach the principle of learning the shortest response to receiving questions. It's really, you know, uh, it, it's often the case where people repeat themselves, but I still see a lot of staff who go through four or five sentences uh, to explain things, and then they find that they have to repeat the same things five minutes later. The reason that's important is that there's a staff burnout element, and sometimes with antipsychotics, sometimes it's the moment when the staff say, I had enough, I'm calling the doctor. So the staff addresses that kind of issue. Uh, the informal and sexually inappropriate patients, for example, uh, it, it's very important. It's one of the things we teach our nurses. And nursing communication with the doctors uh, is also a very integral part to the COM protocol. If you don't remember anything from today's uh, uh, discussion, remember the modified SPAR. Um, in the regular SPAR, which most of you are familiar with, um, the nurses communicate the problems, but then they have to come up with recommendations. And unfortunately, with dementia care, um, not only are we making a lot of decisions on the phone, but also the providers are becoming rubber stamp to or yes or no um, function uh, to say yes to the antipsychotics or no and having to explain why. So we identified this as an issue and we said the Recommendation has to come from the physician or the nurse practitioner, and the nurse's focus should be teasing out as much information as possible about the case and the background, and also being ready to respond to questions, uh, because obviously the provider is not on site and they need a lot of information. Um, so breaking down dementia symptoms, recognizing dementia symptoms that are not treatable, recognizing psychotic symptoms, uh, and recognizing when to treat those psychotic symptoms. Uh, those are some of the principles the nurses are taught. Uh, yet, the decision on use would still fall on the uh, providers. Uh, avoiding night calls and weekend message. That's really one of the hugest deals, and that's why we have the DOM review the cases that happen at the hour. Um, family education, I'm just going to say that uh, some people are doing services for families. I actually think unless you're doing the in-service every week and catching every new family, it's really impractical. The families would know and learn whatever your nurses know and learn because that's their point of contact. If the nurses are on board and they know what you know, then they'll communicate that to the family. Um, and uh, the other piece is addressing uh, certain uh, principles, like, for example, medications cause more confusion, most medications, if not all, uh, that affect the brain. So anything that's caused by confusion will get worse. Um, and knowing, again, setting their expectations. Uh, that's the sunrise from Portsmouth. Um, so the leadership model, I'm going to skip over, but basically it's important to recognize this, that without the medical director, administrator, DOM, being on the same page and championing this forever, not as a, a QI that will last a month, uh, it wouldn't work. It's, it's always going to relapse to the prior state. 
Um, so I won't go all the way now. And I'm actually going to just tell you the leadership challenges. So the staff turnover and maintaining education, that's one of our leadership challenges. Um, addressing minority opinions, so you're always going to have one or two people that don't believe in this, and the leadership has to address that. Um, the consistency of communication, you would have one person saying one thing or another uh, until we meet with them. Um, uh, setting the right expectation and teaching the modified ad part to every new person. This is Portland. Uh, this is the medical providers model. So I'm going to spend about 10 minutes doing this, and then we can go to questions if any of you have any questions. Um, education, the medical providers, obviously not all medical providers are comfortable with dementia care. Uh, and I would say if they're providing care to dementia patients, they have to be given an opportunity to learn about dementia. Uh, otherwise, they're going to pass the bus to somebody else. And if, if it's unavoidable to get psychiatry involved, and it's only psychiatry that's managing your dementia cases, then they need to be the ones working with the medical director to reduce antipsychotics. Uh, but you can imagine if you reduce the psychotherapy in your facility to only three, uh, it's not a good incentive for the psych service to be as involved. Um, and we also focus on the treatment and diagnosis, of course, like doing the medication part, if necessary, and how to do it. And the first question we ask our providers is, are we only using antipsychotics in the medical And the obvious answer is yes. Uh, if you have a 20% rate in your facility now uh, and you have a 100-bed facility, that's one in five patients. And we're not even counting the Ativan, the Trazodone, the Depakos. Uh If you added all the psychotropics, you'd be surprised. It almost ends up being 80% in some cases. And it's really all chemical restraints if we, if we look at it appropriately. Now, it doesn't mean that a few cases don't need to be on it, but when the providers are prescribing it, we teach them to be able to defend that decision based on science and evidence, not based on saying that I got called and that's what they asked for and that's what, what I was. Um, practical guidelines uh, that we have for our providers, uh, again, this, uh, Prescribe it when it's dependable. Don't prescribe it because you're asked. And also, uh, consider paper even in cases where we absolutely needed it at some point. Uh, dementia residents evolve. The dementia gets worse. The confusion changes. Uh, sometimes their behavior changes. So just because somebody was on the, on the psych floor um, two years ago doesn't mean that they can't tolerate a paper now. Uh, also keep in mind that delirium cases, let's say that I need the eye, and they have pure psychosis with hallucinations and grabbing at things and thinking, you know, poisoning their food, etc. cetera, so you have to treat it. Uh, then keep in mind that most delirium last for two months. Uh, and we teach that to our providers. One of the things um, that uh, we address uh, with the providers is that you have to address the antipsychotics at the game. So when people come in, we can address it right there and then if they really need some of these meds or not. And I can give you one quick example is that if a person was never on antipsychotics and was started in the hospital, then that's an easy decision. Because if it's confusion related behavior, then the antipsychotic makes the confusion worse, then you would be doing harm not good. If you want to give them something to sleep for three days, that's another story. But if you're doing it because they're confused, then antipsychotics is the wrong drug. Um, so we address some of that. Recent new orders, if you're not comfortable and somebody got uh, put on it uh, in, uh, recently, then we, we have a time limit. You know, you can put, we tell our providers to uh, start with keep the same meds for three days and we evaluate because during those three days you have enough information uh, to base your decision. But uh, the major exception, and this is like the opposite of everything we're talking about, 
is that if somebody's coming straight from the site floor and they had a major breakdown recently and a lot of major antipsychotic use uh, was part of the plan, then you can't just treat them like everybody else and start tapering. You have to allow enough time uh, to pass. So, so I find, and this is important, you will find that your pharmacy will not take that into account, and they will send a gradual dose reduction recommendation. It's actually imperative to say no to those until the right time. Um, and also end of life, so if somebody is uh, at the end of life and they do have hallucinations from your pain meds, et cetera, uh, it's important to treat that. It's not okay to say, well, we're trying to keep our numbers down and we can't treat it. There's two sides to the coin. Um, all right. So uh, the treatable, uh, again, we mentioned that. I'm just going to say that through delirium and through psychotic symptoms that impede the patient's quality of life or impact other residents in a severe way. Clinically avoidable cases, everything under the sun that's confusion-related, that they resist care that confusion-related, that they're staying up all night because so that's their pattern, that's dementia-related, that's not psychosis. That they're exit-seeking, they're confused, uh, they're not delusional. That the obvious polypharmacy that we teach our provider that eliminate the causes uh, in the medication list if possible. Uh, and then what to do with, to treat the behavior. Like, uh, even if it's non-psychotic behavior, there's room for uh, cholinesterase inhibitors as a trial, but they're not already on it. In case of advanced dementia cases, dementia is, uh, is an option. Uh, because you can actually, it could be the treatment. Now, I should say that uh, I don't have any conflict of interest with any drug company. So if you see me using the name, it's not to promote them. Uh, I don't do talks for them. So, and that science club would say, that, not that anything is wrong with it, but I don't do it. So the other uh, things we teach the providers is just know your antipsychotic so you know what to use. For example, if you're going to use Lysidol um, uh, or Esperidone, you have to know the, the uh, duration and half-life. So it's not it's a drug that's used once or twice a day, not five times a day. If you're using Seroquel, uh, uh, then you should know that it's eight hours, and you should know that it drops your blood pressure, and you should know that it's very sedating. So if somebody's on it at night only and they come from the hospital, that's an easy switch to a trazodone for sleep because that's what's being used for. So we provide basic information now. And this list, I do include the latest um, antipsychotics because most of the time they're not prior authorized anymore. The side effects. Now, this is important from the family perspective and because uh, when we talk to families and say, well, this antipsychotics, one of the problems is that it can cause sudden death or early death. They don't seem to mind that too much, and so uh, for various reasons. So we, I, we focus on the symptoms that matter, and they happen to be true. So everybody's afraid of stroke. That's why you have 100-year-olds on Timidin. And everybody can understand that antipsychotics can cause uh, extra pyramidal extra side effects, gait issues, falls, dysphagia, uh, everything like Parkinson's. And so they can understand why that's a problem. Um, this is also for clients. So a special cases that we teach our uh, providers around, I'm going to mention uh, one case, and then move on to questions, and you have the rest of the slides, about 15 more, uh, to, um, to review if you're interested. The Parkinson's patients with behaviors. Now, you can imagine we get a lot of cases with Parkinson's. Uh, in skilled and long-term care, especially at the latter stages. And some of the Parkinson's medication uh, were pushed to the limit before they got to the nursing home because they were trying to keep them independent. And now that they're at the nursing home, they're a very high dose. And some of these drugs can cause psychosis from true hallucinations and delusions. And I find that 
you know, instead of adding a medication to treat those psychotic symptoms, we can just eliminate or reduce the dose. So we I oftentimes eliminate the evening dose of Parkinson's medications. And that works um, uh, oftentimes. And also imagine if somebody's restless at night and they have Parkinson's and you're giving them something that keeps them very active at night. It defeats the purpose. So think about that. Um, the, uh, this slide has one of the new drugs that came up to treat true psychosis associated with Parkinson's. So that's why I included that here. Uh, now, keep, again, keep in mind, you can eliminate the one drug uh, that causes the problem, then you don't have the need to add another drug, even if it's the right drug. Uh, and keep in mind that Parkinson's patients have a lot of blood pressure issues. So things like Seroquel that drop your blood pressure, uh, even though they're very popular with neurologists because they have the least uh, uh, marketed symptoms, uh, they're not really uh, very friendly to Parkinson's patients who have blood pressure issues. Um, and also, one last thing is that all antipsychotics will give you man-made Parkinson's. So that's extra pyramidal side effects. So if you're dealing with a Parkinson's patient and you see antipsychotics added, you have to question that every time because they cause Parkinson's. So uh, Parkinsonism. So if you're if you're trying to help them, you can eliminate that drug and reduce their Parkinson's medication if you can make it happen. Um, Lewy body dementia is another thing we uh, you know, somebody asked about it, we'll talk about it some more. But uh, I'm going to just mention one more symptom, which is the akathisia. Akathisia is when people are running around nonstop, walking, and they're always on the go. Guess what drugs cause that to be worse or cause it to be worse? Antipsychotic. So if you see a patient like that, get any antipsychotic, it's really, uh, you know, contraindicated. <laughs> the most contraindicated of all contraindicated. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to ask you to uh, send your questions, and I'm going to move the conference to Doreen so she can ask some questions. Hey, Dr. Pitelli, first. Yeah, we just want to thank you for uh, taking the time and sharing a little bit about COM. We we do have a bunch of questions in the queue, so I'll, uh, Doreen, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, one of the approaches to antibiotic stewardship is to monitor provider-level data and get feedback to each provider. You are a high performer. You're not a high performer. Is there a role for this type of behavioral nudge with reducing antipsychotics? Uh, yes. Can you hear me still? Yes. All right, good. So uh, the answer is absolutely yes. So part of, remember we said real-time feedback is part of the COM protocol? So we not only give them the data at the end of each month, but we also review the cases that happen from day to day. Uh, so the providers know their data, and I find that uh, this is universally true, that nobody likes to be an outlier. And so if you tell a provider that your facility is performing below average, um, it's, it's not going to sit well, and they're going to try to do better, I'm pretty sure. And if they know that they're doing the best thing for their residents and doing better at the same time in terms of statistical analysis or quality measures, uh, that's all positive. Okay, thank you. Can you give some examples of readiness to respond? Uh, for example, if a nurse calls me and say um, uh, a person is agitated, then I will be asking about triggers. Uh, was there anything different today compared to other days? Um, and if they say yes, uh, then we address that particular trigger um, with that nurse. If they say no, then we have to go further back and ask more questions. If any of the other nurses mentioned this, so they have to go through the nurse's notes and review those before getting back to us. 
Um, so what are the vital signs? Uh, again, from the very basic questions to very specific questions. And sometimes they have to pause, put me on hold, and go and ask the CNAs, but they have to be ready to respond. Okay. Uh, what would you recommend for homes whose medical director does not su subscribe to the reduction of APM? Yeah. The, uh, I have a slide. One of the slides you will find is what, what if they say we don't believe in this. Your only way of doing this is going back to basics. Uh, doctors are scientists. They're taught to be scientists, to review data, make sense of the data, and make decisions. So if you review the data with the medical director, expose them to the data, expose them to the conferences and talks where that data is being discussed. For example, if they don't know the dementia symptoms versus psychotic symptoms, they don't have that background. They see that as one, and they think that they're advocating for their uh, residents by uh, prescribing. So then it's very hard to sway them by saying, well, the state doesn't want to, or the federal government doesn't want to. It's important for them to understand the clinical reasons. And most doctors, I mean, once they get in uh, to that and see the success, like, they would see the difference when a person is on antipsychotics versus not. Uh, the success is infectious. I mean, they, they start seeing this as a very positive thing that they have to advocate for. By the same token, nurses are the same way, by the way. Uh, nurses are great advocates for their residents. So once they learn that all these medicines make their dementia worse, and so everything that's confusion symptoms will get worse, then, then they have to advocate against our medication by necessity, and they do. Mm. Is there something RNs can do when being asked to slide a re resident over to another type of drug after they have already eliminated an antipsychotic? I'm sorry, uh, you're talking about shifting to another drug like an Ativan or something else? Uh, Marty? Marty? Yes. All right. So that's one of the biggest challenges. It's no good to, in fact, in my opinion, most of the time the other drug is worse. So when I was a younger doctor, most of the uh, medication used for dementia care was benzodiazepine. And one of my biggest fears when this initiative came uh, that maybe some doctors will revert back to Ativan and Valium um, and because it's less regulated. So it's a bigger issue. It, uh, it treats no symptom because the anxious state that we described is often a secondary symptom, not a primary symptom. They're anxious because you're not letting them walk as much as they want or you're closing that door or you're trying to give them a shower. But they're not truly having anxiety disorder, panic disorder. Um, so when those other drugs are used, you get the same consequence in terms of worsening their dementia and causing falls, increasing their incontinence. I mean, imagine if somebody has only urinary incontinence and you give them a drug, a psychotropic, and now they're more confused so now suddenly they have fecal incontinence. That changes the entire dynamic of that resident's care. That changes their quality of life. That changes their depression. If they're mildly aware of their situation, they would be embarrassed and depressed about it. So all of these things are really horrible and, uh, and should be avoided. Now, I did want to mention one thing. Like if a family asks for it, I don't know if anybody will ask that question, but just in case they didn't. If a family says, well, I need it, I want it, I don't care, you need to treat that the same way you treat a request for a physical restraint. Well, we still have families asking for physical restraints, I'm sure. And I'm not seeing many facilities putting people on physical restraints just because the family asks for it. Okay, uh, we have another question. In the buildings in Maine where antipsychotic reduction was successful, did any of those buildings have dedicated dementia special care units with a large population of people with dementia? 
Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the, uh, and the, I'll address that in two ways. Um, there is a genocide unit in Maine, um, and there are a limited number of beds. Uh, but keep in mind that almost 80% of your population has dementia. And like I said in the slides, you end up with 5% minimum of cases that require a lot of attention. So to say that, you know, our cases are worse than others or your cases are worse, um, it, it's really not statistically defensible because most long-term care facilities have a lot of dementia patients because now people are waiting so long to get to the nursing home that they do have dementia the majority of them. So, uh, and I'm, I'm personally also against uh, putting these residents in specialized units, uh, mostly because there will never be enough beds to house that many people. And the second reason is uh, you need to learn how to treat these people on site and not put all the bad apples in one place. And suddenly you have a horrible unit where the quality of life is very poor, and you have to put... 90% of the people on medication. So them being spread out through the building actually helps you. It's not a hindrance. Okay. Is there any data on whether the new regulation requiring a face-to-face -face clinical evaluation every two weeks' time for PM antipsychotics is having an impact? You have to define your um, measure of success here. So your impact is your numbers. Um, so the, the latest regulation that came was a time limitation on as needed medication. That was the latest change. And it's kind of in line with everything else. So um, there's not enough data now to show whether it had a major impact or not. We'll have to wait for the next two or three quarters to see if the national average drops significantly. I find that, uh, like everything else with dementia care, uh, this is multifaceted, so you don't have one thing that leads to good results. There's no silver bullet in quality uh, initiatives, just like there is no silver bullet in treatment of dementia. So if you have everything falling in place and everybody's on the same page, you always have a few cases that are exception but you end up with the majority of the cases without medication. Now, keep in mind, if, you're, if you get good at the tough cases and you get better at it, you will find that it makes every other case easier to handle. You learn from those experiences. Are you available to provide education to providers in states other than Maine? Yes. Okay. How can you identify cases in which chemical restraint is suspected, even though the indication on the order does not reflect chemical restraint? For instance, Nudexta being used for chemical restraint. Uh, Nudexta is one is a unique drug, and I have a slide on that if you look at it. It's uh, it's for PBA, physical bar affect, and uh, basically it means uh, emotional incontinence for lack of a better word. So uh, a person would repeatedly repeat the same thing or uh, they're laughing uncontrollably or they're crying uncontrollably without meaning to. So when you talk to them, as soon as they're distracted, they stop crying. And when you say, why are you crying? There's no clear reason. Uh, and you can't ascertain a clear reason. Those ones, the next say is used in the, it's really a quinine and a cough medicine. So it's an antiarrhythmic and a cough medicine. It's not sedating, so it can be uh, it can be labeled as a chemical restraint. The only issue with it is arrhythmias. If you you know if, if the dose is high enough, but the dose is usually is not. And then the other issue is you use it and it doesn't work, so you have to stop it after a month or two. It's unnecessary. But to go back to the original uh, premise of the question: How do you label something chemical restraint? If the provider cannot defend the use of that medicine based on symptoms and or diagnosis, then it's a chemical response. 
Okay. Um, how could facility QAPI committees engage their medical directors to be active participants and drivers of quality improvement efforts focusing on antipsychotic medication reduction? Uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, you could think of this this way. If the provider is asked to be part of something on paper and maybe do a couple of thoughts, it's not enough. So they have to be part of the planning and part of the discussion and the, and the um, as you start this. So if they understand the problem uh, by numbers, so if you show them your numbers, you compare yourself to 20 miles around you, you compare yourself to your state. And you say, this is where we want to be and this is where we are. Uh, we have data that we can share with the providers, uh, if they have nurse practitioners, etc. Can you help us um, understand all this data in as much detail and then be the source of information for our nurses. Can you help us? And if they learn it to the point that they can teach it, then they learned it to the point that they can do it. Okay, we have uh, time for this last question. Do you happen to know if there's any relationship between residents on uh, Invega Sistema and Akathisia? Uh Yes. Well, uh, again, it's a group effect. You know, for example, when we look at uh, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, the drop in platelets, uh, that's a group effect. Uh, if we look at them when we say it increases C depth, that's a group effect. All antipsychotics cause atrophy. And in fact, there's an ICD-10 code for it, where it's called drug-induced atrophy. Uh, so you can, we can't claim that one of the new antipsychotics is not going to cause it. We'll have to wait years for the, um, you know, for them to have enough use in dementia or elderly to uh, have data to show that they cause epidemia in dementia patients. All these antipsychotic drugs are not studied in dementia, and so they're not, they don't have the data when they produce them uh, during marketing about the elderly with dementia. So uh, we find it after marketing, so when they're out in the market. Uh, for a few years, we'll find out. But basically, for me, it's a group effect. If all other antipsychotics can cause it, there's no reason to think it doesn't. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pizzoli, for a great discussion. I have just a few last announcements. Um, mark your calendars. There's a webinar coming up on August 14th uh, on prevention and management of C. diff and other HAIs. Also, uh, we are now on social media. Please connect with us on Facebook and or LinkedIn for the latest resources, webinars, and other offerings from the New England Point QIO. As a reminder, we'd like to thank those nursing homes participating in the New England Nursing Home Quality Care Collaborative that has been actively engaged in collaborative activities and committed to quality improvement. If you have received your badge, we're asking you to share your commitment to quality by posting a photo of your badge in, your, in the front of your building and also post it to social media using the hashtag, we commit the number two quality. And don't forget to tag the New England ClinQIO on Facebook Twitter, or LinkedIn. Later this year, we'll be announcing the award winners. The New England Clinic QIO continues to spread best practices throughout nursing homes in New England, and we're asking you to share your successes. I have posted a, a, the link in chat to submit your success story. We will highlight a success story of the month in our monthly newsletter, the link, and we'll highlight your successes with CMS. Finally, here is our contact information for the New England Queen QIO. If you have questions, contact your state lead. Uh, when you close out of this webinar, an evaluation will automatically appear. We, uh, and I'll post that link in a minute. Um, we greatly appreciate you completing that evaluation. 
if you don't have time to, to do that right now or you're sharing a computer with someone else, you'll receive an email tomorrow containing the link to the evaluation. As we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the PowerPoint presentation is currently posted on our website. Within the next few business days, a recording and transcript will also be added. The link for this will also be included in tomorrow's email. Thank you again for a great presentation, Dr. Fazzoli, and to everyone for attending. Have a wonderful day.